That's awesome. Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Beth Foss and welcome to today's webinar with one of our very favorites, Dr. Robert McLaren. Um, we are very excited to have you join us today. We are going to be learning a lot more about Dr. McLaren's work and what's going on with his study and um, things that he has done with gene therapy. So we want to welcome everyone today. I think this might be one of our biggest or most well-attended webinars that we've done so far. No pressure <laughs> on either one of us, more you than me. Um, but we certainly want to welcome everyone here today. Um, we are recording it. We're going to be taking questions at the end. Um, some of them, Dr. McLaren may or may not be able to answer depending on time, um, but we want to just make sure that there are a lot of people here and we'll get to most of the questions as we can. I'll be taking them and posing them to Dr. McLaren at the end. You know, I have to give a shout out, Dr. McLaren. I had to check with Corey because I thought it was a little bit later. Uh, but he said it was 2008 when we first started uh, working together and learning about your work, your preclinical uh, research with Dr. Siabra, which led to some clinical trials. Uh, there's an awful lot of people that are already commenting. Hello, hello. Uh, you're such a familiar face to our organization. And I know I'm speaking on behalf of all of us um, about our great thanks. And we want to give you honor and respect and great gratitude for the work that you and your team have done on gene therapy for IRDs, most particularly our, you know, our disease, choroideremia. So thank you for carving out the time. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to minimize and I'll meet you at the end. And um, anything else you need from me right now? Well, thank you. Um, so what, what I, um, by the way, welcome uh, everyone and, and thank you for joining. Uh, I, I'm Robert McLaren, I'm Professor of Ophthalmology from the University of Oxford and I've been working on choroideremia research for, as you said, about 15 years now. What I thought I might do is just give a quick overview of where we come with the research and how we got to where we are today. Then I'm going to give a quick summary of our recent phase three trial and the results which were published this month in Nature Medicine. Uh, and finally, I'll give you perhaps my own personal view on, on where I think we're going to go in the future in terms of therapies. And of course, very happy to, to take questions. But I think it might be useful just to just to go through a little bit of the background first, which hopefully will explain explain things to you. So um, I will first get my presentation up, and I'm going to share the screen. So let's. We can see that, thank you. All good, okay, good. Uh, so uh, I just mentioned again, I'm Robert McLaren. I should also, we have to declare interest. I, I have been listed as an inventor on several gene therapy patterns, um, but my primary role is a, as an academic and professor at uh, university in Oxford. Um, I would like to start, as I often do talking about gene therapy, in acknowledging the huge, achievements of Jean Bennett and Al McGuire in getting the FDA approval of Lux Turner. And this really is something that has really set the stage for all of us working in the gene therapy field, the fact that a treatment has already been approved. And so what we're thinking about now is what next, you know, what other diseases can we treat? And of course, given the impact of choroideremia and the relatively small size of the gene, uh, this is something I became very interested in following on from, from the work that I've been, uh, that I've been following from, from Jean's and Al's team. So the disease we believe was originally described by Mautner in 1872 uh, in Austria and uh, in Innsbruck. There are uh, patients dotted around the world. I have actually was at a meeting this morning with the ambassador from Finland talking about the choroideremia impact in Finland in the, in the Lapland region. Um, when the choroideremia was first described, uh, it was believed to be a stationary condition like inflammation uh, because, and again, this is the appearance, but because the appearance appeared to be so static, you know, patients were viewed like year after year, nothing seemed to change. 
the early ophthalmologists assumed that it was a static disease. Maybe someone had inflammation and this was like scar tissue. And it wasn't really until the 20th century that people began to realize from photographs and looking at over time that this was actually slow progressive degeneration. Uh, and again, you can see now that the appearance uh, of the back of the eye in choroideremia. Choroideremia is basically derived from choroid and eremos. Eremos is a Greek word meaning barren. And there have been frequent misspellings by adding an A in here, uh, A-E-emia, as in a hemia, e hemia, which means the blood. It's nothing to do with the blood. The Greek derivation is quite different. It's eremos. And when I published the first paper on choroideremia in the Lancet, the editor insisted on the old spelling. And I had to get one of my professors of English literature at Oxford University to actually write a note and correct him uh, on the linguistics and say, no, the derivation of this word is definitely from Eremos, so therefore it should be spelled with the E rather than the A-E. So uh, you, everyone who's American speaking and writing will be pleased to know that the American spelling is now prevalent and is the only one that, that should be used. Now, the thing about REP1, the gene is 1.9 kb. Okay, it's quite small. This is the missing gene in choroideremia. It's on the X chromosome which, as we know, means that males generally will be affected and females generally will be carriers because they have two X chromosomes. One normal X chromosome will compensate for the disease in most cases. So disease is passed from females to males. A male can have a daughter in which he will pass on his X chromosome, she'll be a carrier, or he can have a son, in which case he passes on the Y chromosome, which does not have the choroideremia mutation on it. The Y chromosome from the father is completely normal. So a man with choroideremia cannot give it to sons. He can only give it to daughters who then become carriers and, of course, can subsequently have their own affected children. Uh, there are new mutations arising all the time uh, in choroideremia, and we've seen a region of the choroideremia gene that's relatively unstable. It's got these um, CG dinucleotides, and when we see this in genetic sequence, these uh, get modified over time as methyl groups may get added as part of the way epigenetics regulates gene expression uh, in, in humans and, and other primates. And then this can mutate from a C to a T over time when the amine group uh, deaminates. And so over time, we see CGs converted to CGs. And we've noticed in the choroideremia genome, there are five uh, so these CG repeats that quite often uh, become TG, and then unfortunately the choroideremia gene sequence is disrupted and an affected patient would then have choroideremia. A question I always ask myself early on was, do we need to target the choroid? And this is quite an important question. If you're doing gene therapy, you're targeting a layer of the retina. Okay, You can target the retina itself, which is the neural part of the nerves, or you can target the retinal pigment, the bit beneath it, or underneath that is a choroid. And with a disease called choroideremia, you know, instinctively one thinks it must be a disease of the choroid. But actually, when we look at the structure of the retina in more detail, we see that the retinal pigment epithelium, actually, it kind of like sustains the choroid. And if you lose the retinal pigment epithelium, you the, the underlying choroid degenerates. And modern imaging techniques we have, such as OCT here, you can see the leading edge of the generation, which is marked by the black arrow here, is ahead of the choroidal degeneration, and you can see it gets thinner as we go out. And we see this also with laser scars, we see this also in AMD. When you lose the RPE, the choroid degenerates as a secondary phenomenon. And that tells us that probably the retinal pigment epithelium is the main layer with which we need to target. We have some evidence on that here as well. Uh, this is a carrier lady, okay? So she carries the mutation, and she's got this mottling of the pigment epithelium, okay? This is pigment epithelium. Because the X chromosome is randomly inactivated, uh, normal cells, abnormal cells, and they're randomly scattered around, you know, literally 50-50. So where she's got regions of the abnormal cells, because they've got the choroideremia X chromosome, they will undergo degeneration, you'll get this pigmentary change. Whereas where the, um, the normal gene is expressed, normal X chromosome, this will be entirely normal, uh, but it'll be blotchy and pattern, and pattern. And what we see here is we see this pattern in the retinal pigment epithelium, but we do not see it in the choroid. OK, the choroid shows none of this pattern, as you'd expect for a carrier of an X-linked disease. It's purely in the retinal pigment epithelium, again, indicating the retinal pigment epithelium is the primary cell layer that needs to be targeted in choroideremia. Here you can see again, in the periphery, the typical appearance of a carrier, where you've got the pigmentary changes due to mottling of the retinal pigment epithelium. But if you look at these blood vessels here, these long lines, this is the underlying choroidal vasculature. This is entirely normal. 
Now, in this lady, the cells of the choroid 50% will have the abnormal chrome peptide chromosome, 50% not. So we would expect if she's a carrier and it affects the choroid to see the disease in this layer as well, but we do not. Now, this is another condition which helps give us some indications about choroid renal and the mechanism. Looking at the back of this eye, you know, right eye, left eye, again here in the nasal area, you know, it looks just like choroidremia. I mean, it's just it's identical to choroidremia with the scalloped edges and the exposure of the underlying choroid. And the autofluorescence is, again, classic for choroidremia, where you've got this, uh, you know, these, these, these islands, these islands of um, autofluorescence and surviving RP, which is which. This condition, though, is not choroidremia. It's actually, and again, an OCT, again, looks just like choroidremia. This condition is not choroidremia. It's caused by dominant mutations in RP65. Okay, it's quite a rare condition, but with RP65 gene, you know, normally we have the recessive form treated with Lux Turner, but you can have a dominant mutation which causes degeneration of the retinal pigment epithelium cells. And RP65 is only expressed in the RPE cells. It's not expressed in any other cell type in the retina. So again, when we see the appearance of RP65 dominant mutations as being virtually identical to chloridemia, this gives us very, very helpful information. Again telling us almost certainly that choroideremia is a disease of the RPE, okay? And the reason the choroid generates is by a secondary mechanism because the RPE is died, not because independently it, it needs the choroideremia gene. So this really helped inform us in the surgery. So we want to do a subretinal injection to target the RPE in the retina, and we can do this very nicely with the adeno-associated virus. You've got the terminal repeats, the replication, the capsid gene. This is a single-stranded loop of DNA uh, in the middle, and then you've got the capsid, which is an icosahedron, uh, a protein shell. You know, viruses are very, very clever because they do things by natural evolution. And if you look at the platonic solids, there's, I think, the icosahedron, the, the, the dodecahedron, the cube. You know, they basically, there are five of them in total, and they have ways of repeating the same structure, the same surface, multiple times to generate a three-dimensional object. And the icosahedron is the most space-efficient way of replicating your uh, your 20 faces to give um, the maximum volume relative to the surface area. And the viruses, nature has worked out how to do that for us, which is incredible. This virus is small enough that it can dissolve in water, in fluid, it can be in solution. It doesn't need to have a cell membrane. Most viruses, as you know, um, of course, everyone's heard of coronavirus. It's got this big membrane with this crown-like structures. Adenovirus, lentivirus, they've got a cell membrane around the virus itself. This is just the protein shell, what we call the capsid, and the DNA is inside. There's no cell membrane. And this makes it very, very safe. because It's very less immunogenic uh, when we do the surgery. And, of course, we want the virus to go and express the gene indefinitely and we don't want it to trigger an immune response so aab is really ideal for that purpose now we can take out the rep and cat genes we've got about 4.7 kilobases of space in which to put our gene therapy and this is the design of the choroidremia transgene we've got the coding sequence for rep one here which has got the start code on and the stop code on and i mentioned to you that's about 1.9 kilobases we also included a promoter to switch the gene on we use the chicken beta actin promoter to switch the gene off on and the bovine poly a signal to switch the gene off this and this are exactly the same as in lux turner we use exactly the same sequence similarly we have an intron and an exon here for splicing very very similar to lux turner the reason for this is that we like to have a splicing mechanism where the RNA is chopped because it helps with export of the RNA from the nucleus and therefore increases the gene expression. This ribosome binding site in Kozakin synthesis is where the ribosomes bind to translate the gene to actually make the protein at the mRNA level. And we have also a thing called WPRE, and this helps augment the gene expression. So this is effectively the viral vector we use in the croid Reunion program and all the patients so far. And again, it builds on similarities in viral vectors that are already established in clinical practice, most notably Lux Turner, which is identical except for this bit where Lux Turner has got the RP65. This makes mRNA. The mRNA will get translated. And then after splicing, this will be expressed in the nucleus and then in the cytoplasm of the cell, pretty much indefinitely for the life of the cell, where it will be translated into protein. 
All the evidence so far suggests that as long as the cells are not dividing, the AAV gene therapy will be a single event that will have a lifelong effect on the cells which are transduced. People always say to me, well, you know, with Laxderna, they have the treatment and they've treatment effect has worn off after a while. Yes, it does, because unless you target 100% of the cells with exactly the right dose, you're still going to have cells that are still going to continue degenerating as part of the natural history of the disease. It doesn't mean that the cells have been transduced to the virus are degenerating. Obviously, they'll still remain. And what you tend to see is like a slight decline like this, and eventually emerges a plateau where you get to a state where it becomes a steady state. And of course, that's what we're looking for uh, in proidemia and other genetic diseases. This just again, just another schematic showing that the, the construct we made. And here, this is a, the two things we submitted to the regulators to get the trial approved. This is the Western blot showing expression of the rep one protein from the AAV vector. And this Western blot is useful because it tells us the size of the protein compared to the control here. Um, and then we've got um, this experiment here where we add uh, RAB6A to the, to the protein mix to see if it interacts. The REP1 facilitates the biotinylation of RAB6A, which we can see here nicely with these bands, which gives us an indication that this REP1 protein is functional because, of course, as we know, the geronylation of proteins, the modification of proteins, is a key role of the REP1 chaperone protein uh, in the retinal cells. In addition, we have immunohistochemistry. This is a mouse retina showing a subretinal injection. And you can see here in green, the REP1 expression, very, very nice in the retinal pigment epithelium, and also in the outer retina, in the outer nuclei of the rods and cones, nice green expression compared to the control in which there's nothing expressed at all. So this data, the Western blot with a functional analysis and the immunohistochemistry, that's all you need for a clinical trial. I mean, you need to make the virus up to a very high level, of course, but, you know, there's a limit to what you can do where there are so few species that have choroideremia. And as you know, it's embryological lethal. It's embryologically lethal in all other species that we know of so far, apart from humans, uh, including mice, by the way. We can do experiments in mice which carry the mutation, the carriers, but we can't we can't get a hold of mice which have got choroideremia in the human situation. And the reason for this is to do with the effect of rep one in the placenta. It I think causes some form of placental instability. And when the placenta develops, you, you can have male and female elements of the placenta, which derive from the mother or the father. And unfortunately, the male element is needed to allow the placenta to grow. And of course, this um, comes from the croidrema gene that can unfortunately um, create problems with placental growth. So, so there's a reason why we don't see it in, in nature. But for humans, we, we can. Uh, our, our genetics are different. And of course, we, we have the croidremia disease uh, without any associated problems with the placenta or anything else that we're aware of at the moment. Now, delivering the virus includes an operation, as a vitrectomy operation, uh, and injection of the virus under the retina. Now, I must say, you know, I'm, I'm a strong believer in subretinal injections. You get a very high concentration of the virus in exactly the right place. And intravitreal injections, unfortunately, you require so much virus to get through to the RP that there's a very high risk of getting inflammation. And one of the things we don't want to have at all is inflammation. Because not only does inflammation cause damage to the retina, it also alerts the immune system that a virus is around and your T cells will come in and they'll eradicate the viral particles that you need to create the treatment effect to transduce the retinal cells. So people say to me, well, you know, subretinal injections, it's risky. Sure. OK, so, you know, the surgery is difficult. It's risky. Okay, it's new. We don't do it before. I spent most of my career reattaching retinas, treating retinal detachment. Now I'm learning to detach them. But the solution is to make the surgery easier, to develop the surgery, to develop the techniques. It's much, much easier to, to improve a surgical technique than to change the fundamental laws of nature, which we would have to do to make an intravitreal injection efficacious. Just simply for a start, it's going to be diluted by three knob units before, by the size of viscerous before it gets threatened. So at the very beginning, I was focused on developing the surgical technique. And we did initially a subretinal blend of saline to raise the vector to raise the retina in the target area before injecting the virus under the retina in a very delicate way that we subsequently found has been robust uh, and effective uh, with relatively few side effects. Working out the volume of the subretinal injection, here we can see if you imagine the volume, this is much this picture on the right here, you've got A to B. And you've got in red is the retina pigment epithelium, and in blue is the retina. We want to detach the retina and make like a what we call a bleb. It's like a little blister. 
You can work out the volume that you can inject under here from H1 and H2 by something known as the spherical cap formula. Okay. Now, everyone assumes that science is very up to date and we need to check regularly when papers get published. It, it didn't take long to find this formula because it was developed by Archimedes about 2000 years ago. So just simple appreciation of simple laws of physics and mathematics can help us calculate the volume that we can inject on the retina without causing excessive stretch and how to do it effectively without damaging the retina. This led us to the understanding that the further away you get from fovea, the less stretch you'll get because you'll get proportionally much, much greater volume. So for instance, one millimeter away from the fovea, the maximum volume you can inject without stretching the retina is 0.1 micro, microliter. I mean, that's a tiny amount. You know, you're never going to be able to, to do that because you know, there's no device I know that can inject such a small volume. So, you know, at best it's going to be 10 microliters. But if we go four millimeters away out to here, we can raise a retinal blend and we can actually get 35 microliters of fluid in there, which is perfect enough for doing a, a gene therapy without stretching the retina. There will, of course, be some stretch initially around the injection site. But as we get closer towards the fovea, the detachment becomes very, very gentle with minimal retinal stretch. And really, this has been key to this choroidremia program to try and maximize the success and safety of the surgery. So here you can see this is the blood. Okay, initially, quite a rapid expansion. And then very, very slowly, you can see the leading edge of the subretinal injection going down towards the fovea, which is down here. And by the time it gets here, it's a very, very gentle detachment of the retina. And um, indeed, this gentleman uh, gained some lines of vision uh, after his uh, after his successful gene therapy. Uh, we now use the OCT microscope to get an even clearer view. And you can see I'm doing surgery here. You can see on the left here, there's a little blip. Now, what I noticed here, interestingly, is that it's not just a subretinal injection. There's actually there's actually structures within the retina. So it's what we call retinoschisis. And this bit here in the middle is a subretinal component, but either side is a bit of schisis. Now, I hadn't noticed this before, but what this means is the surgery is a little bit difficult because if I didn't have this view, I wouldn't know for sure if my bleb was subretinal, as it is here, or if it was intraretinal, which it is here. The other thing that the OCT is very helpful is I've moved it now. So I'm doing the injection here. I've moved the grid up to the fovea because I'm now detaching the fovea, which is this bit here. And I want to do this very, very gently. And you can see I'm putting my foot down just to inject a little bit more. And very, very slowly, very, very slowly, the fovea is just lifting off. I'm just peeling it away from the underlying retinal pigment epithelium, again, in a very, very delicate way. And we really have optimized this to make it very, very safe. And the OCT microscope for help. Again, you can see the fovea detaching nicely. Um, it looks a bit stretched just because the way the OCT works, but it's not as it's not as elevated as, as it as it appears on this picture. And as I said, this patient also did extremely well. This is a more late stage patient, a little bit more tricky because there's quite a lot of degeneration. And here I'm using some air bubbles that just helps open up the space. Again, I'm identifying the subretinal space from the intraretinal space. That's subretinal just under the phobia here, and that's intraretinal with the schesis here again, subretinal here. Interretinal here. So I really need this to know I've opened up the subretinal space. So I want the virus to go in here. There we go. I want the virus to go in here. That's where we need it to target the residual retinal pigment epithelium uh, in this patient. Um, now, here's another formula. This is Hooke's law uh, based on laws of stretch. And when you stretch a thin surface, like you imagine you've got a linear surface here with the cross sectional area A, length L. If you change the length by 10%, of course, you're going to get a stretching but it's going to be uniform across the, um, the, 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 um, the line that's being, that's being stretched or the area that's being stretched according to a given pressure. If, however, you have a thin area in your elastic um, solid, whatever that might be, and I, for example, put cross-sectional area of over five here, one-fifth, then when we apply pressure and detach the retina, you're going to get a five-fold stretching of the area. That's five times thinner, okay, according to a modification of Hooke's law. Uh, and Hooke, as you may know, is a, a physicist who worked in Oxford in the 18th century. So here again, in choroideremia, we're a bit lucky because actually in choroideremia, the retina in the center is relatively well preserved. It's the peripheral retina that tends to thin. So we tend to get more thinning and stretching of the peripheral retina than the center. Uh, and so subretinal injections are really quite well tolerated in, in choroideremia. But nevertheless, we do have some times where we have a thin area, such as this patient. We're targeting this area of the choroid with the, with the bar vector. 
this area here is a bit thin, and you can see that there's actually a tiny membrane there. This, if we do a solar injection, this is immediately going to open up because it's going to be very thin. It's going to stretch a lot. So what I've got here is I'm using a little bubble of heavy liquid, which compresses that area. And that basically keeps the pressure on and stops the fluid going underneath the thin area, whilst enabling it to go around the edge to target the area I want to get the bar rector to. And I've actually got some blue dye here. I'm using this one in 50 blue dye, which is quite a nice way of seeing where the fluid goes, just to check that none's going underneath it. Um, and then you can um, take out the heavy liquid at the end uh, once you've applied the gene therapy vector. It's a very useful little adjunct to the surgery. So again, it's just an example of how we've developed the surgical technique to make it safer and more predictable uh, in patients. Uh, now, finally, I'll talk a little about dosing. So, so if we're giving a dose of virus to a patient, say we give a dose of gene therapy um, and we target the retinal pigment epithelium cells, say we target, we happen to target the phobia, well, these cells are likely to preserve, be preserved, but the non transduced cells are likely to die away, okay? Because they haven't had enough of the virus. It's a suboptimal dose. And so normally with phase one trials, you start with a low dose before you move to the high dose. So if we're going to be looking at visual acuity, we might see an increase in the visual acuity at the beginning whilst we put the REC1 transgene in the central cells supporting the phobia, and that may well be sustained. Eventually, if we wait years and years and years, we'd see a decline in the control line. But if we look at microperimetry, which is a reading taken over the average of all of these cells, sure, initially we get a gain, but then we get a decline. And I mentioned before, eventually what we look for is we're looking for a plateau, okay, eventually. And this decline, indicates the decline of these cells around the edge, which have not been transduced with the virus. So when people look at this and say, oh yeah, look, the gene therapy effect is only temporary. It's a suboptimal dose. And what happens, unfortunately, is with the phase one trial starting beginning with a low dose, you slightly increase the dose. So they're the ones you've got the longest follow-up for. Uh, and of course, this is a very rational explanation. Um, the other thing we worry about is those the retinal pigment epithelium. How much do we give, you know? How much dose? Imagine these are your retinal pigment epithelium cells at the back. Uh, say we get 15%, okay? So we get 15% of the cells, one here in red, you can see two. Um, what happens next? Well, those cells have got the rep one transgene, but the surrounding cells, they, you know, they, they're not transduced. So we've only got 15%, so eventually they will degenerate and we'll be left with our 15% cells. But it may be that these cells are just too sparsely populated to be able to survive on their own, and eventually they degenerate as well. Alternatively, if we get 35%, again, we've got many more cells now transduced to the virus. The non-transduced cells, of course, will decline, they'll degenerate away. And it may just be that 35% is enough to keep the retina alive, okay? What we don't know is what the lowest level is, but what we do know is that 50% is enough because phenol carriers have 50% effectively. We don't want to get to 100% because we don't want to risk inflammation. We want to get ideally to 50%, but probably Maybe 35% might be enough. We don't, we don't really know yet. So the other thing you need to be aware of is that people are different. Okay. So we can talk about details of dose, you know, endlessly, but the reality is that each individual, each amongst us, has a completely different immune system in the way we react to viruses. And a good example is the HIV uh, pandemics, how HIV spread across Africa and Europe, and more recently, of course, COVID. You know, some people don't even know where, not even know where they got the infection. They get a positive test and even know they got COVID. Whereas others are incapacitated and very ill on intensive care, okay? Because of how they react to the virus, it's quite different. And the same is true of gene therapy. So I've got some examples here of the patients. Now, I said to you 50% retinal pigment epithelium is probably the, the target we need to go for, basically to make a male choroideremia patient into a, into a carrier. For one patient, might, we might need 10 to the 12 genome particles of AV2 to achieve that. But in another, we might achieve it with 10 to the 10. We, we just do not know because it's different in individual people. So what we really want to do is we want to, we want to give the maximum dose that is likely to, 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 to get a treatment effect in everyone, even though it might be a bit much in some, we want to pick up as many as possible without causing inflammation. 35% again, 10 to the 11 in this patient, 10 to the 9 in this. So we wouldn't want to be dosing patients with 10 to the 9 because we'd miss all these patients with 10 to the 11 and so on and so forth. So this is really the maximum dose we want to achieve. So the question about dosing is a very difficult and complicated one. But what we really need to do is we just need to find what is the maximum safest dose. And everyone's going to get that. And if this patient here with 10 to the 11, okay, this one's going to get 35%. 
But patient two with 10 to the 11 is going to have 85%. Fine, no problem. As long as it's not causing inflammation, patient two will be happy, patient one will be happy. 10 to the 11 will pick up the minimum dose in the very resistant patients and also allow a maximum dose that is still tolerated in patients who are very easily transduced with cheap therapy vector. The manufacturing of the virus is dependent on many things. Okay, so you've got the manufacturing, the purity of the AEV, how many full to empty capsids you've got, how well is it manufactured, um, how efficacious is the capsid, you know, how well is it transduced to cells, and how well is the expression of that gene inside the capsid. And of course, it needs to be delivered successfully surgically. If you do an operation and 50% of the virus gets refluxed into the vitreous, because it's difficult surgery, it's only 50% of the dose. Okay. So these three factors will determine the real dose. We know about the efficacy of capsid expression per set. We pretty much optimize that. The manufacturing, uh, we have pretty good manufacturing, and this is getting a lot better than in the early days where we can get a very pure um, concentration of virus. If you've got, when you make AAV, not all of the capsids have got genes in, in them. Some of them are empty, and, and there's a ratio called the full to empty capsid ratio. If your full capsids are only 10% of the total, then your therapeutic dose is 10%, but the actual immunogenic dose, dose is, is 10 times that, because you've got to include all the empty capsids which will stimulate the immune system. So we're getting there 90% with manufacturing. And as I said, techniques that we've been developing are making the surgical delivery much, much more successful. Um, in choroideremia, there is definitely a functional defect. We don't see it in everyone, but in some patients, here's a young boy. Again, he's got 20-20 vision, but his micropermetry shows a reduced retinal sensitivity in the areas of the retina uh, before he's got significant degeneration. Okay, And the retinal pigment epithelium is beginning to be affected. We can just see slight mottling here. But you know, this is a, he's, he's working well, he's running, he's doing well, he's 20-20 vision, but, but you know, there's a functional defect. And so when we're designing a trial, we want to try and reverse the functional defects. We can see it much more quickly than waiting for a change in degeneration. Um, and this is just from our early, this is just from our early Lancet paper. We noticed in one of our patients, his fixation changed, the area exposed the virus, which gave us an indication that something was going on. His vision also improved. And this is quite interesting. This is one of our patients in the early trial who independent of coming to see us in our research department, was also visiting his home optometrist. And you can see in 2009, the visual acuity is 69, 636, and then back to 2010, 612, 636, and then 2011, 612, 636. But then he had the gene therapy, and when he went to his optician in 2012, the following year, 612, 618, 2013, 612, 618. So his optometrist had independently picked up an improvement, uh, a gain of two lines of vision, two cellular lines, which is equivalent to three uh, ETDRS lines of vision, just purely by routine monitoring uh, when he went to get his spectacles prescribed. So that was just a very nice uh, example. And of course, his optician assumed he had cataract surgery. And uh, when he said, oh, I'm, I've had cataract surgery, so I have, I have had gene therapy. Uh, and they all got very excited, and all the optometrists and the optometrists all came and had a look, and they all peered in with the ophthalmoscopes, and they, they all sort of stood back, and, and, and then uh, the optometrists are very disappointed. He said, well, you know, uh, we can't see anything, <laughs> nothing's changed. And of course, that's exactly what I wanted to hear because obviously he didn't have any problems with information. He's quite happy with that. So it's just a nice example of how the patient story just helps give a bit more information that we don't normally get uh, in the clinical. And this, of course, matched what we were measuring when we were doing the formal testing for them in the clinic. So we reported in Nature Medicine the improvements in visual acuity, in treated eyes, small but statistically significant improvements in visual acuity uh, in the treated eyes. This, of course, was an... Um, it was a non-blinded trial. Those patients were aware of what they'd had, and you know it wasn't a proper clinical trial in terms of regulatory process, but certainly showed very promising results in early stages, uh, and certainly was enough for us to then go on to do a phase three trial. <clears throat> this was led by Nightstar, the university spin-out company, and this Nightstar was funded by uh, venture capitalist funding from the Wellcome Trust, and we basically started the gene therapy program. And it included several centers across the United States, uh, Helsinki, Copenhagen, um, Germany, and um, I think I'm slightly out of place there. Uh, that should be France, that should be down here. My apologies to any French listeners. Uh, oh, maybe maybe we could say it's the French-speaking part of Switzerland. Anyway, and so, of course, big center of surgery in Miami, uh, Casey Institute up here, Byron Lamb leading the trial in Miami, 
uh, Mark Panessi and Andy Lau, uh, again, leading the trial up here in Portland. And towards the end, we also worked with uh, Jason Commander, the Mass Eye and Ear Hospital. These other centers were referral centers. They referred patients for the treatment centers, um, 15 ophthalmology centers across seven countries in total. So um, I'd just like to say thank you, Mark. That's a, that's a very quick journey of our route from the beginning uh, to the phase three trial. I'd like to acknowledge the help from all members of my research team. Um, particularly, I should say, I have research optometrists like Amandi Josan here, um, you know, who are developing a lot of the, the ways we measure vision, okay, like the microperimetry, the low luminous visual acuity, the way we can interpret vision testing in choroideremia patients, we get reliable results that go beyond simply uh, visual acuity. Uh, this is Dominic Fisher, who led the trial in Germany as well, and in in in, in Tübingen, who's quite an influential uh, PI. He's now moved back from Germany. He's actually moved back to Oxford. He's a colleague of mine here now in Oxford. So I will stop sharing my screen. I see there's a few questions, and I'm very happy to take some questions on that, and then I can go on to the next part, talk about what we're doing next. Okay, that would be great. Let's let's get through these and then you just uh, let us know when you want to move on. So we'll start at the beginning. What What is your minimal age to be a patient to be considered for clinical trials? Uh, it's 18. We don't like to do pediatrics unless we really have to because the consent process is more complicated. You know, they can't really give informed consent. Parents have to give the consent. Makes sense. Uh, we have two questions uh, from Paul. To which extent are the surgeries being executed with a robot arm, or are there some clinical trial phase three surgeries still being done by hand injections? And in the future, would there still be a desire for more robots to support in surgeries? Um, we're not using the robot in the gene therapy program at all. Um, the reason is the robots are still experimental, um, and we're still working on it. I've been doing robot surgery um earlier this month we, we, we've got a big research program we are talking about gene therapy which is an experimental product experimental medical um you know it, it's, it's a medicine rather than a device it's just too much to develop a device in parallel with a new gene therapy product uh because from the regulatory process how do they know if the adverse events are due to using the robot the device or due to the drug product or indeed, if there's a treatment effect, how do they know what the cause is? So we have to be a little bit careful of that. It will be a technology will be applied in future, but at the moment, we, you know, we, we're quite happy we don't we don't need it. Uh, but it will, I think, make a slight improvement, uh, not just for Freud dreaming, but particularly for some of the other conditions where the retina is very thin. When people receive surgery, to which extent, which extend directly after the surgery, is their sight impacted? And approximately how long does it take till their sight is stabilized again in the desired situation? Okay, well, normally the next day, it's a bit blurred. Um, and then usually by about a week, the visual acuity will come back to normal, but the colors will be a little bit washed out. Um, and then probably by about a month, that's when the gene is expressed. And if they are lucky enough to experience subjective improvements in vision, it's normally around about a month from there onwards. Um, around about six weeks, we need to be careful because that's when the effects of the immunosuppression wears off where they may be susceptible to inflammation. So watch them quite carefully during that time. But assuming they get through that, then it should be maintained from thereafter. Wonderful. Professor McLaren, elegant subretinal delivery procedure. Compared to dry AMD patients, do you feel less resistance upon the flow entering into the subretinal? For example, in STGD patients, the subretinal was never well developed, thus it was very loose. The maximum volume is 1,000 milliliters and then James Bainbridge case, majority of the fluids immediately being dispersed towards the back of the choroid space not efflux to the vitreous cavity. Woo, thank you. <laughs> That's a long statement of fact. I'm not sure the question, but I, I will say I've, I've done gene therapy and AMD as well. And one of the problems with AMD is that the RP can be quite unstable. So you can get you can go under the RP if you're not careful. Also, the central part of the atrophic area, you don't really need to go there because there's no living cells there. So you really want to have the blood go around the edge and you can do more than one injection. 
Um, I, I know Jim very well. He's a very good friend of mine, a very compl accomplished and skilled surgeon, and I've operated with him uh, in the first Luxterna kit, well, not Luxterna, the precursor back in 2007 at Moorfields. The one mil, hundred you know, thousand, it's too much. The volume is just too much. You don't need that much. You're at risk of getting a retinal detachment that persists the next day. What you want to do is you want to target the macula. Okay, Most of our visual function comes from the macula, which is the central part, the central 30 degrees, and you'll easily do that with 100 microliters. I'd rather target the macula with 100 microliters and rescue those cells and then have no problems with post-optical retinal detachment, no problems with inflammation due to a huge volume of virus being injected, and no problem of getting retinal folds, because when the retina reattaches, if it's a big volume, it may come back and have a fold in it. Okay, the vision could be worse. Uh, and if I am going to target a patient's periphery, I'll do a separate blade nasally, possibly one uh, superiorly to cover, it's in my left eye, the nasal blade would be a little bit more out here, and superior would be a little bit more down here. Okay, because that's the functional vision. You don't want to be going so that you can see right up here. You know, there's no point putting a huge volume of virus to get extreme peripheral vision of course we could move our heads and move our eyes and look so that's that's my my take on that another more technical question viral vector can pass through the br barrier dr bennett's work showed that if we could increase the surface tension by adding low concentration of the surfactant excuse me to the media it could hold the vectors for a while before they are leaking out toward the choroid it could possibly increase gene transfer efficiently. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we use the surfactant. We use the uh, 0.001% PF68 chloronic acid surfactant, exactly the same as used at the Luxterna. And it, it's nice. I mean, it's supposed to stop the virus sticking to plastics. Uh, in the injection virus, you have to be a little bit careful because it can get can get a few bubbles in it. But, you know, no doubt this, this has got a benefit. Um, we don't really want to get into the choroid. You know, as I said, explained at the beginning of my presentation, the choroid is not the, the layer that we want to target. The more virus we put in the choroid, the more virus that crosses the blood retina barrier, the more likely we are to stimulate the host immune system uh, and generate a T cell response and get inflammation. So we don't really want to do that. We want to keep as much of it in the subretinal space and in the retinal pigment of feeling as possible. I'm going to go over to the chat and ask a few more, and then you let me know when you want to continue, um, Dr. McLaren. Here's a personal question. My 16-year-old son has choroideremia, which is considerably aggressive. I understand the sample age for the trial is for the adult men, but, there can, but can there be an exception made for him with our consent based entirely on his case and the disease aggression at this young age? We live in Texas, but we are willing to travel um, to the UK, of course, for treatment and all the other follow-ups. Unfortunately not. You have to remember the cold facts. A clinical trial is to get a treatment approved. It is not done to the benefit of the patient. Mm -hmm. Now, a good example, of course, is that he might get put in the control group. Okay. Now, you can't have people just being pulled out of the trial because they get into the control group. The reason for going to clinical trial is to develop an approved treatment that can then be applied to everyone. The other thing is we normally have two doses. We may have a high dose and a low dose, so one may be better than the other. We, we don't know. In our trial, both doses were in the efficacious range, but a lot of patients were in the control group and didn't actually get anything. So, you know, we mustn't get that mixed up. Now, the other thing I'd like to say is that choroideremia follows an exponential decay. So the degeneration initially is quite quick, and particularly in teenage years, when you get the central macular involvement, it appears to be progressing quite rapidly. Then it slows down a lot. And we've actually published a very nice paper in ophthalmology about three or four years ago, doing mathematical modeling, looking at exponential decay, similar to how radiation decays over time in choroideremia patients, to try and characterize exactly the rate of decay. And it appears to be fairly consistent in everyone in terms of the half-life, but it starts sooner in some people than others. And the half-life means that the generation gets slower and slower and slower as the patient gets older. The analogy I would give, again, if you have a cake, you cut the cake in half, initially you take half the cake away, but you know, two years later, you cut the cake in half again, you only take a quarter. Two years later, again, an eighth, a sixteenth, but a two. So the amount you lose over a fixed period of time gets less in time due to the exponential decay nature in choroideremia. So I'm afraid I would have to say that you know, we can't break the rules of the trial. They are set. And um, if you're going into a trial with your son, you need to get in the mindset. This is not to help him. It's to help the entire population of proidremia patients. And that decision sometimes is made more easily in someone who's over the age of 18, who we would argue could give informed consent. Right. 
What has the research found as the major reasons to those who have ne had negative reaction to the gene therapy? I participated in phase two and was treated on both eyes. I significantly lost vision, both central and periphery, immediately post-treatment of both eyes, and it has continued to degenerate at a faster speed than before. Oof, tough. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that. I mean, the phase two, certainly what I was involved with, didn't, didn't involve both eye treatments, but um, we, we know that there have been some problems with, with inflammation, uh, definitely. And um, this is a major risk factor for gene therapy. It's, it's, it's always inflammation. Um, the Gemini study is a study that was done on treating one eye and then the other at a later date. Again, I, I don't know the specifics, but in most cases, the patients have tolerated the bilateral eye treatment well, but there may be some specific reason, possibly inflammation, possibly a complication of the surgery. I, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. And, you know, it does highlight some of the risks of being in a trial. If you've had gene therapy to both eyes, there will undoubtedly be some benefit to that in the long run, but there may be some initial adverse effects from a complication that were not expected or the surgery or the inflammation, which is a known complication that should be managed. Do you think the FDA will ever approve any treatment for choroideremia? <laughs> yep, I do. Uh, and I'll explain a bit more about that uh, in due course. But yeah, that, that, we're, we're getting that. It's a long journey, but we're still on track. Uh, it just takes longer than expected, but we'll get that. And uh, again, how do you select candidates for these trials? We decide what we call the primary endpoint. In other words, the thing that we want to get improved in terms of visual function that we agree with the regulators. And we then select patients in whom we think we most like to get that primary endpoint. So for example, um, the FDA required a three line gain of vision. The European Medicines Agency were happy with two lines, but we went for three lines because the FDA mandated that. Now, clearly we're not gonna take patients who've got excellent 2020 visual acuity, early disease, because we're they're not gonna, they can't improve by three lines because they're already at the human maximum, okay? Um, and similarly, we're not going to take patients in whom the vision readings are so so difficult because they're so advanced. We're not going to measure anything meaningful. It's too variable. So we, we then have a, a window and we'd intervene in that window. If a patient has any clearly surgical issues that would make the surgery more complicated, uh, could potentially increase the risk of side effects, like a macular hole, something like that, obviously we wouldn't want to include those patients either. So generally speaking, you have inclusion criteria, which would be vision in a certain range, and then you'd have exclusion criteria, which are things where you wouldn't want to do um, the gene therapy um, and that's pretty much it and that, those are those are all established in the protocol and agreed with the with the FDA before the trial starts you know we have a slew of questions but I know you have a lot more to share and uh, I can't keep you all day right I would love to have you for the rest of the afternoon but if you would like to go ahead and keep continuing on your presentation because I think that might answer some other questions that are here um, let's go ahead and do it that way. And then we'll get to more questions as your time allows at the end. Does that okay. work? Yeah, I'll I'll just give me a minute while I, I reload the next talk um, okay. and do the screen share. Perfect. In fact, what I'll do is I'll do it this way. Good. Now, hopefully you're looking at a bar chart with some blue columns. We are. There. Yep, we sure Great. are. Okay. So this is a summary of the results of the phase three trial. And I've just put this picture in, this figure, because it pretty much explains the key issues uh, you can, of course, look in detail at the paper, which will give you information about the adverse effects that patients had and the safety. But this really is the key uh, key metric, if you like, in terms of what we uh, what what we're looking for. So, this A is the patients who had three line gain of vision. Okay, in other words, those patients in whom we're looking for a three line gain of vision, which the FDA wanted us to show uh, in order to get. Um, in order to get uh, to give us the approval um, of the drug, 
And here you can see, obviously, not in the control group, one of 34 patients in the low dose and only three in the 65 patients in the high dose achieved a three-line gain of vision. Now, the probability of that happening is around 0.3. So it wasn't statistically enough to be sure that the treatment effect was caused by the virus or whether it's just a random effect, okay? But clearly favoring the treatment eyes compared to the untreated eyes. In B, this basically shows the mean change in vision, okay? This graph A shows the number of patients who achieved a three-line gain, okay? So it's a small number of patients in a total cohort. In B, we're looking at all the patients in the cohorts, every single patient, and looking at the mean change in vision. So we're not looking at what percentage have made a big gain, we're looking at the overall changes. And again, you can see the control group, on average, lost 2.3 letters by one year, the low dose lost 1.5 letters, and the high dose, on average, lost minus lost you know a third of a letter, minus 0.3. So again, a clear trend in favor of treatment. In this case, you can see from the error bars, there's quite a lot of variability. So this this was not a primary endpoint, and it didn't meet statistical significance, but it's just a trend showing, again, favoring the treatment groups over the control. Now, C is interesting. C is actually a two-line gain, OK? Now, when you look at the statistics for the two-line gain of vision, it does then meet statistical significance. You've got the high dose, 14%, 18% of the low dose. They achieved a two-line gain of vision compared to only 2% caused by one responder in the control group. And this patient may have just had a particularly bad day when he did the baseline level, because at one year he'd come up by two lines, not three lines, but by, by two lines. If you look at the probability of the high dose compared to the control, you see the probability is 0 0.017. So uh, basically a 1.7% a chance of this happening by, by, by accident, which was which had been easily acceptable by the regulators. And if we look at both groups together and compare the treated eyes versus control, again, a 0 0.007, a probability of 0.7% that it occurred by accident. Again, that would be enough. Had we chosen the two-line gain as the primary endpoint, then we would have met the endpoint of the trial in terms of the clinical outcome, which again would have been encouraging. The European Medicines Agency were happy with two lines. The FDA wanted three. And one of the problems we have, and one of the things we argued with between, is that we want the FDA and the European Medicines Agency together just to go and have a chat and come to some agreements because it helps us a lot. Because you can't have two primary endpoints, you have to have one. We chose the wrong one, unfortunately. Now, because the primary endpoint is not met, we can't really apply statistics to the secondary endpoints because the primary endpoint is the one that you go for. But this could have been negotiated, okay? Now, Biogen was sponsoring the trial, and I have a huge amount of respect for Biogen. It's a very um, forward-looking um, company, uh, and it's um, it's been extremely helpful in, in allowing us to write up all the data from the clinical trials, which will all be in the public domain for, for future reference, which is, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and, you know, I, it would have been nice if Biogen had negotiated with the regulators this result, because it's clearly very good. But the reality is that the manufacturing costs are excessive because of the regulators' requirements of manufacturing. The patient population is relatively small with choroideremia. And ultimately, if the regulators make such a high bar for the manufacturing and distribution costs of the viral vector, then you may have a situation where it's just not commercially viable to continue the program, even if it works. OK, so this is another thing I've been fighting with my colleagues to try and get the regulators to lower the bar a little bit for making viral vectors. And a good example is you can make one batch of the virus. It can be enough to treat maybe 500 patients. You know, OK, let's get one batch approved. We'll approve the batch. And then, you know, we can come back and we can discuss with FDA another batch at a later date. But in order to get a manufacturing process worked out so that every time you make the same dose of virus again and again, and again that is like order of magnitude more expensive than just testing a batch, testing a batch. And then when you get a batch that meets all the you keep that batch, do another one, not enough, not enough, another one. So you basically, you do the batch per batch testing. And if we can get them to agree that, that would that reduce the drug manufacturing cost from about 100 million to 10 million or even less. So that's where we've got to go. And we need some some movement from the regulators and they need to shift their position because the reality is with with um, with gene therapy for retinal diseases, with the amount of virus we need is very, very small compared to how much we can make with one batch. Uh, and this again, this is a figure D from the paper. This shows the proportion of patients who maintained one line of vision. Okay, in other words, less than five letter decrease 
Um, in the control patient, 68% maintain one line of vision by one year. The low dose, 71%. The high dose, 83%. Again, favoring the treatment. Both the low dose and the high dose were therapeutic in this trial. We, we deliberately made sure that the, um, the low dose was therapeutic. And if you look at our original paper in the Lancet, we had low dose when we moved up to high dose. We saw treatment effect in low dose as well. But statistically, you're more likely to get a treatment effect with a high dose because if you're losing virus with the surgery, if it's getting, you know, you're getting some reflux, you know, it's not ideal, you don't get quite enough virus in the right place, or oh, that patient's a little bit more resistant, a little bit resistant, you're going to get more success with a high dose. And so certainly when we look at the testing where we're testing it a bit more, including all the patients, like the um the mean change and the preserving your one line of vision, we definitely see a treatment effect that favors the high dose. So that was a result of the um, phase three. Um, now I'm going to show you some preliminary data, and I, I'm, you know, I'm not supposed to show preliminary data. If I was a drug representative of a company, we wouldn't be able to do this. But I'm going to show you some preliminary data. From another study we doing, just to give you the heads up on where we're going next. Um, this is a study we've done where we've been looking at very early intervention in patients with choroideremia. It's a University Oxford-sponsored trial that was set up before NightStar. And thankfully, Nightstar and Biogen were, were happy for me to continue with this completely independent study, which basically looked at early intervention in choroideremia. And we've noticed that there is a two patterns of the fluorescence in choroideremia. There's a central area here, called the, which we call the smooth zone, and a peripheral area, which we call the mottled zone. And we know from our studies on microperimetry and also prior to that OCT imaging, that the model zone, the retina is quite affected, it, it, it shows signs of generation, the retinal pigment is quite, quite diseased, but the central smooth zone has got healthy RPE and good retinal function. And what we think here is we think that we're looking at, this is this is before the retinal pigment epithelium is compromised, and this is after it's compromised, and we can measure the smooth zone, and here you can see a control eye, treated eye. When we look at the degeneration from the edges all around, the total area of that water fluorescence, which you can see um, in the bottom left here, what you what you have here is you have a gradual degeneration, okay, of both the treated and the control eyes from the very peripheral mottled areas, which are which are quite diseased. But when we look at the smooth zone only, we can see a separation with a preservation in the treatment eyes compared to the control eyes. Okay, so we are interested in this endpoint. Now, in order to get this endpoint approved by the FDA, we need to do more work on um, describing the function of the uh, function of the overlying uh, retina and also the time course generation, all these sorts of things, which we're currently applying for funding to do. We think that if we can show some, you know, in a randomized prospective control trial, this is just incidental data from an early study that was non-blinded, non-randomized, you know, that we will be able to convince them together with the data we have from the phase three study, which whilst not meeting the primary endpoint, is nevertheless hugely uh, promising. Uh, in terms of the outcome measures, that that would be enough to get regulatory approval. Now, if we can give small boosts in visual function, that's good. But if we can't slow the degeneration down in the very late stages, because it's very advanced, we're going to need another approach to try and slow down the generation and prevent the cell death. But in the earlier stages, if we can show slowing down or halting of the generation, particularly this very early area of the smooth zone, then clearly that's going to be a very useful endpoint. And that would make a very, very valid argument for approving a gene therapy treatment. So that's what we're doing at the moment. Um, you know, the next section. So I'm again, happy to take more, more questions on that. I think you're on mute. But... Perfect. Thanks for letting me know that. That wouldn't work well. So we'll start at the very at the top here. It says a three line BCA BCVA gain is remarkable for CHM patients. So that's just really encouraging. I think um, there are several questions from our members about what advice would you give to our younger or medium teenagers, early twenties, going forward with research to in regard to choroideremia. What would you have us tell our our families? Well, you need to you need to have regular checkups with the ophthalmologist. Okay, now I know for a fact that young men in their early twenties, fearing the loss of the driving license, 
you know, they're not they're not going to come to the clinic if they're going to lose a driving license, basically. But as a doctor, you know, my obligation is the patient. I've got lots of people who come to my clinic. I'll tell them, look, you know, you shouldn't be driving. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to report them. I'm not there to to tell the to tell the, the, the driving license authorities that you know they're, they're some decision they need to make themselves. Okay, we do not want to prevent people coming for a checkup. The important coming in early is that it's helpful to know where everyone is. So when we start the trial, we've got access to all our patients. But we don't want to get a patient we've never seen before and just put them into a trial. We need to do these tests a few times to know how stable they are, to know whether they can do the test properly, to get a bit more of a history. Um, and most ophthalmologists who manage choroid and genetics will know about the trials. They'll come to meetings. Most of them will know me personally, and they will talk to me, and we can discuss things, and we can work out what's going on. That's all you need to do. There's nothing you really need to worry about on the internet, but you need to make sure you're being seen regularly by an ophthalmologist who understands what choroid is, not someone who looks down at the back of the eye and they, oh, I haven't seen that before. You know, there are plenty of specialist centers where you can go. Uh, Brandon asks, what advancements, if any to speak of, do you see in treatment making it to the next three to five years? Well, it's going to be a year's type process. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll be there within five years, but I don't know because we need to run this other study and find out more about this early stages. Uh, and try and find a way of showing a slow degeneration in a randomized prospective controlled trial in a way that's acceptable to regulators. This will take time, I'm afraid. And, uh, you know, I don't think it'll be three years. It may well be five. For the people that have already received uh, phase one or had one eye treated, do you see any treatments for the second eye being done? Um, possibly. Um, but at the moment, since we're not running a trial, uh, not not yet, um, but you know that's not to say that if the treatment becomes available, then everyone will get both eyes treated, and those patients who've had one eye treated will then get the second eye treated. Is there a max age that one can participate, and are the Canadians being considered? Uh, there's no maximum age. I think the oldest patient we've had in the trials was 72. Um, I'm happy with Canadians. I'm sure their retinas detached and they're quite safe. There's no issues as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, obviously, for running clinical trials, we need to be working in countries where they understand the clinical trial process, where the departments are working. I'm going early next year down to Brazil to see my colleagues there to get them up to speed, to get patients in South America, at least in the trials, to be followed up. I was just in Japan uh, last month, again, talking about the Koyumi program there. And I travel widely to make sure that all the centers around the world are aware of what's going on. You know, if you're in a very impoverished country in Africa, it may be challenging, of course, because the government may not prioritize it. But what we found is in some cases, it may be possible to have a be part of a trial in another country that is actively running the trial. But for Canada, there'll be no problem. I've been to Canada. We've done gene therapy there. The healthcare system is very good. The, the, the gene therapy surgery setup is excellent. Are there any measures that must be carried out by patients after receiving the treatment? Uh, they need to be take. They need to take steroids uh, to basically suppress the inflammation, um, and they need to be monitored. Very occasionally, we may need to um, increase the steroids or add additional immunosuppressive treatments uh, if there's a lot of inflammation. But rare, I would say probably about five percent of patients need quite aggressive control of inflammation, but 95% will be fine. Thanks for letting me just give these to you just like this. I appreciate that. What is the percentage of positive results for patients that have been injected by the virus? Well, what do you define as positive? I mean, I, I can show again that data mm -hmm. from the phase three trial showing that, you know, 14%, 18% gain two lines of vision, the treatment eyes. Uh, that the overall preservation of vision at one year was better in the treatment eyes uh, in terms of the mean loss of numbers of letters and also those in whom one line of vision was preserved. But if we go to three line gain, you know, it was quite a small percentage because we only had, you know, like 5% gain three lines. Now, of course, you never normally gain three lines of vision spontaneously. It's quite unusual. So those patients who have the gene therapy, a small percentage had a three line gain, a much greater percentage had a two line gain. Uh, and the general trend was in the favor of the treatment. But again, it's difficult to say for sure how each individual patient has, has done because there may be additional complications from inflammation, which could unfortunately result in the results being, being, being not so good. Nama asks, so good to hear from you, Nama. 
Um, is the star data guaranteed to come back to Professor McLaren? Uh, yes. Um, when Biogen decided not to continue with the ophthalmology program, it's not just stars, but everything they, they had as a commercial decision. The way the license, the, the way the IP was licensed from Oxford means that the IP has come back to Oxford University, which now still owns the IP, which means we're in a position now to commercialize and license out the IP again to another company. If we can get them interested by showing them the perhaps preservation of the smooth zone or some other aspect of retinal function from following up the patient's with the gene therapy before, then we can provide, or university will provide them with the IP to do what they need to do. So again, Biogen have been very good in, in, in following the rules and reverting the IP back to Oxford when they decided to discontinue the program. Does it make sense to approach the EMA or the MHRA instead of the FDA? Uh, it does, and of course we work with both, but you know, there's two issues to getting an approval. One is showing clinical trial data. The other is having a manufacturing process that is approved by the regulators. If you're getting an approval for a new antibiotic, then of course you need to know that 500 milligrams on the on the packet is what's in the tablet that you take, not 400 or 600, but 500. That production process needs to be approved as well as showing the drug works. We also, as I said, you have a big hill to climb in generating a manufacturing process that can make a biological product, AAV, virus, vector, which is hugely variable, a huge concentration and a huge amount of purification that is exactly the same dose on the vial when it comes out the other end. Okay, that is the challenge. We need to get them to shift on that. So they will approve it on a batch per batch basis. So we can make 10 batches, maybe throw out eight, keep two that are in the parameters that we want. We don't want to have to make a production process that gives us the same dose in a vial without having to test it at the end. That's that's going to be too difficult. And I don't know, will, will it be EMA? I must say I've been working on EMA. You know, I was at a year round a meeting uh, in Amsterdam uh, earlier this month. They're gonna they're gonna think about it. FDA is still challenging. And I sometimes ask myself, what happens if the drug product is approved, gene therapy in Europe by the European Pain Medicine Agency? And the FDA still says no, you know, the gain of vision isn't big enough or the manufacturing process is not up to our standards. What's going to happen? Um, I think politically it's going to be a difficult one for US government to deal with because it's not just one country, but the whole Europe. And they might they might say, oh, okay, we'll <laughs> we'll follow, we'll approve. Okay. So, you know, I think the EMA is going to be a more reasonable, you know, regulator for us to work with. I think they understand the concepts a little bit better. Uh, but I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. There's several questions here about how we can help as a patient organization to promote this therapy. And I would just answer, unless you have a different one, Dr. McLaren, that, that we work together very closely. You work with FFB, that there are many things that are being done. Um, and if there are any things that our organization can do, you certainly would let us know, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, I go to the major meetings. I normally catch up with your team at Arvo. Um, I don't go to AO off, often because it's a bit of a trek, but I go to the URF meeting and, and Arvo, and, and that's the time when we'll give updates on everything that we're doing. You know, could you just talk a little bit more just for a brief second, because there's a number of different in the Q&A and the chat feature. How do people get um, ensure that they're made aware of possible treatments? What would you suggest people do? They need to speak to their ophthalmologists, okay? The ophthalmologists, they need to be reviewed by ophthalmologists who like me, go to the meetings, have an interest in genetic eye disease. Uh, not, you know, the guy on the corner who's convenient because the practice is just up the road, who's a cataract surgeon and likes looking at a Freud because they've never seen one before, okay? You need to be seen by a retinal specialist who specializes in inherited retinal diseases, IRDs, and preferably at a major center. And because the follow-up is only once a year, it's worth making a flight to go to a great center. I've mentioned the great centers in the US, you know, you've got plenty there, mm -hmm. up and down the East and West Coast, a couple in the middle. You know, try and go and see a specialist because also you're likely to be in an observational study as well. In other words, your data like to be used for publications, be included, to give more, give more information about the disease process, as well as being engaging with clinicians who understand the position of clinical trials and treatments, what's going to come down the track. Um, 
this is a good question. It says, what adverse effects are most common? And I think that would also touch on some other questions being asked if this is a thing that is the next possible um, treatment that would be coming that you just spoke on is five years out. Is there anything that we can do now or our patients can do to prepare our bodies to be less, have less adverse effects or anything that would um, make our bodies healthier, eyes healthier for this upcoming procedures? Not really. I mean, I would definitely avoid any of these bogus stem cell treatments and other things. Um, keep well clear of that. Um, tempting though they may sound, may sound. The alarm bell should ring when you get the treatment the, to be in the trial for $20,000. You also you have to pay for administrative costs. Okay. Please do not get involved with these bogus treatments, which many patients have, because if you've had some kind of stem cell injection, it's likely to make the inflammation a lot worse when we come to the gene therapy. And we've, we've actually seen that before in another trial. Um, there isn't really anything specific. I would always advise to try and avoid extreme sunlight. So when you're out on the beach or going skiing, wear a good pair of sunglasses. There is some theoretical evidence, and I have great admiration um, for my colleague Ian McDonald in Alberta, who has got some very good biochemistry uh, knowledge, Who who is of the opinion that it's possible that if you take statins that inhibit HMG-CoA reductase, which is the pathway that the simvastatin uh, inhibits, that that may compromise the pathway that's under stress in choroid remix, which is a lipid prenylation pathway. Unfortunately, it's just impossible to choose experiments. You'd have to like have someone on trial for 20 or 30 years to show any effect. But that may be one thing to think about. If you have high cholesterol, try and find another way of bringing it down rather than using an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor. Um, and generally speaking, things that accelerate the decline of cells, the aging process, will most likely make the degeneration more, more quicker. So avoid smoking, a good example. Try and try and lead a healthy lifestyle. There isn't much more you can do, you know, I'm afraid it's a genetic disease, it's determined by genetics. And when we look at different patients, we see degeneration is fairly constant across the whole group, despite the fact they have different lifestyles and different risk factors. There are so many good questions. How much time do you have? Well, I think we're going up to half past, so that's that's fine with me. No, I've got a clinic. 15 after. more minutes? Okay, I'm going to keep going then. Um, if we assume success for the next clinical trial and its approval, can you speak to the interest of Biogen of any other, or I think it's, or any other firm to commercialize the treatment? Can you answer that? Bi Biogen has made a commercial decision. I mean, they're very much focused in, neurodegeneration, particularly Alzheimer's disease, um, it's unlikely that they will reopen their ophthalmology programs. And of course, you have to appreciate that companies have to make decisions that are sometimes difficult uh, in view of remaining profitable and remaining viable. Their duty is to their shareholders. So um, that route is probably no longer an option. Uh, we've recently created another company, as another spin-out company, Beacon Therapeutics, which is focused on X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, another gene therapy program we've got. That's possible. There are many other companies out there where they might be looking for additional programs. Our job as academics is to do the basic science. We need to show them how the vector is designed, how it works. We need to test patients with the disease in our observational studies to show that we can provide them with a reliable endpoint, which is consistent and would likely show a treatment effect within one year, because most companies can't run a trial for longer than that. They just don't have the funding. And we also need to work on the regulators to smooth the manufacturing process to get it streamlined, to get it more, you know, so to, to get it more economical. Because at the moment the costs are so high that you know, for a rare disease, you can see how it's a challenge. If the cost of making the drug product is more than what the, the insurance companies will pay for the treatment, then then it's not going to be very, it's not going to be commercially viable. Okay. And on top of that, I've noticed that the contract research organization, the CRA, which is the interface between the company and the patients. They charge a huge amount for the job that they do. And I, I can run a clinical trial as an academic about 10% of the cost of the CRO. So what I will try and do is I'll try and start the trial, you know, initially the trial with like a phase one study where I get preliminary data, the whole thing is de-risk, and then at that point, hand over. I, mean, I, can't, I can't run a phase three trial so, because Oxford University is not a commercial organization that can get a drug approval, okay? But a company can. But if I can at least do the phase one trial, and show safety and some early signs of efficacy, it de-risks it. They can then do the calculations and they'll invest more in it. And that's that's what I'm hoping to do with our follow-on studies. Oh, 
Oh, there we go. I'm back on. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, sorry, sorry. It my my screen just went blank. I thought I lost everyone. I apologize. Um, did you finish? That yep. last question, I apologize. For the patients who have already been treated, will you continue to follow them after five years or 10 years to monitor the effect of GT on stabilization? Yes, we find the following five years. It's also known as the Solstice study. And again, beyond that, I'm currently applying for funding to continue the follow up beyond five years uh, so we can keep track of patients. I do even like to follow them up you know, as long as we can. And since most of the patients who've had gene therapy have been at specialist centers, we're able to track them down and, and, and do the follow-up. Really, we don't want to pull them out separately. We're just going to make sure that when they come to the clinic for their regular follow-up, we'll look at everything and document everything so we know what the long-term effects are. We still have a lot of questions, Dr. McLaren. And generally speaking, and I know you've covered this a little bit already, but again, thoughts, it says, what are your thoughts on young people? Like my 16-year-old, we have another, we have lots of, of parents on here, what would you advise for them right now to keep their hope and their outlook positive? Well, choroideremia is a very, very slow degeneration. That's mm -hmm. great for you, the patient groups. It makes it very difficult for someone like me trying to measure a treatment effect within one year because basically nothing's changing. That means we need to look for some gains in function, which is additionally more complicated. The rate of degeneration is exponential. In other words, fast beginning and getting slow. So one thing I always say to my patients, particularly if they're in that sort of late teen, early 20s when they're noticing changes, is just to reassure them, you know, this is quick now, but it's slowing and slowing and slowing. So the change that notice in one year the next is less and less. Um, and because it's quite slow and because central visual acuity is maintained for a long time, most patients are able to adapt to it and compensate for it. And I've really seen some amazing people in my experience with Croydrimia who've managed to hold down completely normal jobs, you'd never really know. They've learned all the tricks to deal with it and they're positive and, and they go they can go on years and years by, by doing that. Obviously, you need to think a little bit about the kind of job that you do. You don't want to be in an environment where you might get an injury from um, you know, movement around you. You know, like you wouldn't want to be like working uh, maybe with, with vehicles or with machinery, but anything where you know you maybe have an office-based job, maybe interacting with people, all that sort of thing. Uh, it can be done for years and years, you know. So Try and focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. Okay. That is true of everything in life. Ooh, good wisdom there. We have several people who have been participants in the previous trials, whether it be Nightstar, um, 4D, what have you. Can a patient be considered for other studies in our, and therapies if you've already participated in a previous one? Uh, so can I, for example, in the X-linked retinal pigmentosa trial, we're now treating the second eye of patients who've had gene therapy in the first eye as part of their original treatment because we would need to know the bilateral effect, and so they're included now in another trial. So absolutely, they can be in a trial, or alternatively, they may find themselves getting a treatment if it gets approved at a later date. It's unlikely we, we treat the same eye, okay? But assuming one eye is treated, then the other eye would be equally eligible for treatment at a later date. I think, do you have any other recommendations for anything else in terms of vitamins or any type of diet, anything to do, not to do, generally speaking? Uh, no, there is no, nothing you need to worry about. But I would say to you, um, you know, normalize your vitamin levels. Uh, vitamin D, as you know, is quite efficient in Northern Hemispheres, particularly in countries like the UK, which got cloud all the time, not much sun. Also, if you take... Uh, drugs for your for peptic ulcer like proton pump inhibitors and things you can get reduced levels of folate in in your in your blood so you know just make sure that you have enough of the normal vitamins uh, vitamins are of course toxic if taken in excess uh, and so you don't really want to take x you know vitamin a for instance is commonly taken for eye problems but if you have too much of it you know you, you can have problems from it so i would advise people to make sure that everything is in balance uh, and make sure that your vitamin levels generally everything is normalized but don't take any supplements. I'm afraid there's no benefit to increasing those levels above normal. I'm a 53 year old sufferer with two daughters. One of my daughters has two young boys. Is there a possibility to obtain confirmation of um, CHM in my grandchildren? And I would just say genetic testing, genetic testing, genetic testing. Do you have more to add to that? 
Well, yes, no. Okay. Generally speaking, I don't like to genetic test children. Okay, because there are a few implications for having a positive genetic test that may affect their future employment insurance. We don't know. So what I tend to say is I'll have a look and see, and I'll say what I think whether I think they got it or not. If there's no real you know, you can't give informed consent as a child. But what is the what is the purpose of doing the genetic testing? You're doing the test on the child for the benefit of the parent who wants to know. But I can tell straight away if they've got chloridremia because I can look at the retina. However, some genetic tests can be inconclusive. You know, maybe 2%, 5% in some cases, we don't find the chloridremia gene mutation because it's an unusual mutation, or it may be something that's not quite entirely clear. Um, so I think it's important not to test the children unless they're going to be a trial there's a reason to do so but have a look you can make a clinical diagnosis and when they get to age 18 sure you can do it then or if they want to be in a trial they have to have it done to which extent during pregnancy can we measure if a female carrier has given chm to the child where during the pregnancy stage and how accurate can we measure it um that's a good question i'm not an expert on prenatal diagnostics but if you're a carrier, there's a 50% chance that if you have a male, that he will have the gene. So one in four chance for the child. So um, I guess the first thing would be to do screening to see if it's a male or female. Uh, and then if male, it may be possible to take a sample from the chorion, chorion sampling. There isn't really any other indirect way of doing it. You can't sort of do it without physically taking some of the, the tissue. Uh, that's originated from the fetus. So there's a small risk involved, but it can be done. Do you think the success of gene therapy can be linked to the CHM mutation? That's a good question. Uh, we've got no evidence for that. We've looked at that quite extensively. The majority seem to be null mutations in which there's no functional protein. Um, and um, they all appear to behave the same. We found no... The only thing that we've identified is that some patients who have a mutation of what's called a splice site, which is the region that chops up the RNA, they can have a milder disease if a little bit of the RNA gets correctly spliced, okay, and it escapes the mutation. And we think probably maybe 1% of correctly spliced RNA is enough to slow the generation. And um, we published a paper on that in JNA Ophthalmology uh, showing that particular mutation, how, to, how it can slow down the generation. Good. This again is asked by a couple of different people. How do we find doctors, lists of doctors by region who are recommended as retinal specialists? And, you know, we can definitely help you out that with that. Um, you can email Kathy, you can Corey, myself, we can get you lists. It's on our website. Um, you'll be able to find some more information there. Do you have any other recommendations for that, sir? Um, well, obviously our nature medicine paper has got listed the authors and then all the study group sites which all involve with recruitment for patients for the trial, that will be a, a list of the most informed ophthalmologists you'll find in the US or indeed globally uh, in Europe as well, who will be able to advise. Um, as I said, the trial didn't take place in Japan, but in, in Tokyo, in Kobe, there are good centers there. Um, if you're from China, um, I'm not sure entirely, but I know that the Fudan Eye Hospital in Shanghai is very good, Tongren Eye Hospital in Beijing, you know, depending on where you are in the world, there will be a centre where they have expertise and you should go there. You know, if you've got a rare disease, by definition, most ophthalmologists won't have seen it, won't have a manager. And if your follow-up is once a year, then you could potentially fly anywhere. It's, it's a bit of extra effort, but it's much better to fly somewhere and see the expert than go up the road to your local optician, optometrist. I have patients in my clinic in Oxford who come from all over the world, obviously regular patients I see from Australia, South America, Africa, Far East, Asia, everywhere. So it can be done. You know, I don't want to oversee and just make sure I say to you that there's so many positive comments here to Dr. McLaren, just grateful, just thanks. And your and our thoughts are with you and whatever we can do to help you. Um, here's a good question for a lot of people. I work on my computer for a large part of the day. Um, what would you suggest um, to minimize anything with online screen screen time? There's nothing wrong with looking at a screen. The amount of light coming from a computer monitor is about, I don't know, a million times less on a bright sunny day, okay? Where screen time affects is that your eyes get a bit dry because you don't blink enough and they get itchy and burny and you know that sort of feeling like you've been awake too long. That is not 
so that's nothing to do with choroid dream, that's just the front of the eye, how it reacts to a screen. Uh, if you have children who are young, under the age of sort of seven, eight, you want to limit the screen time because it induces myopia in their eyes, so their eye grows a bit longer. But apart from that, once you finish growing, there's absolutely no harm at all with screens, absolutely none. But be aware that if you have a slight tendency to get a slight dry eye because you don't blink as much when looking at a screen, this can cause some discomfort. We have five minutes left. Let me just see again. There's again so many. I apologize, everybody. I'm not going to be able to get to your question. Thanks. Um, again, there's there's actually a couple of questions about Dr. Siabra. In the past, you worked with Dr. Siabra. Are there other scientists, doctors, researchers you envision to collaborate with in the future for CHM? Uh, well, that's a very good question. I mean, Dr. Siabra, um, I know very well he's an expert on the protein function. Um, and the Troy Dream, and he really his his input into the trial design uh, and also the diagnostics and sort of understanding how we could test the area of exome. When I mentioned before, like the prenylation, all that sort of thing is his area of expertise. He's done an amazing job in clarifying that. Um, he's a physician, but he's no longer practicing in, in medicine. He's he's now head of scientists. So I went to see him uh, was it earlier this year, I think, maybe this year last year. Yeah, I went to see him in Lisbon, where he's professor there in, in Lisbon in, in Portugal. So we are at a stage now where we've moved from the basic science into the clinical domain. We need to engage with clinicians who understand the disease, and we need to engage with the regulators to try and get them to understand the problems we're having with treating such a rare disease with such an expensive process we have to go to to get to get there. And I think if I were to ask for you know some time on my own with someone, it would be the head of FDA ophthalmology regulator, the head of EMA op, uh, regulator, maybe a few from the other countries around the world, and just really just give them a, a good uh, rundown of the issues that we have, the challenges we have as investigators trying to deal with very rare diseases, because not only do we have to develop a treatment for the rare disease, we then have to convince a commercial sponsor that it's worth investing their money in to develop the treatment. And clearly with a rare disease, that second stage is clearly proving quite challenging. Any thoughts on acupuncture? Unfortunately, uh, and again, this is my view, so so just personal view, um, there's no randomized controlled trial that has shown any benefit for acupuncture beyond a placebo effect. And don't knock the placebo effect. Placebo effect is a very good one, uh, where if you give someone, for instance, some Tylenol and a control tablet that contains no pain, and they, they take it for the pain, about 30% will feel an improvement in the pain as a result. Okay, so I'm not knocking a placebo effect, but it is a placebo effect. Uh, there's no role, I'm afraid, in treating genetic diseases. It's all determined by the genetics, and we have good data, good biological evidence as to why the retinas are generating, whereas there's no evidence in any way that acupuncture would be of any benefit except improving the feeling of well-being, which, again, is not to be knocked. That can also be positive. Well, I think we'll conclude. We could go on for a couple more hours. But thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you've done and are doing and will do um, for this population. We're very grateful. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak at the webinar. And um, I'll look forward to catching up with you at the meetings uh, in due course. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.